Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, our uh, Transportation and Technical Coordinating Committee for Wednesday, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, it's 1 o'clock, so we'll uh, do introductions. My name is Jeff O'Brien. I'm with uh, Louisville Metro Government. I'll go to my left. Larry Cheney with KIPTA. Matt Mignetti, City of Jefferson County. Bernie Montgomery, Town of Thank you all and welcome. Our uh, first order of business uh, is the approval of the December 13th TTCC meeting minutes. Assume everybody's had an opportunity to review. If there are no corrections, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, uh, next item is the uh, Transportation Policy Committee report. Uh, Larry? Yes, sir. We had a joint meeting, as most of you know, of the TTCC and TPC last month. Uh, at that meeting, we, um, we approved the use of HSIP funds in Indiana. Uh, we introduced a quarterly review process, which we'll be talking at length about today. Uh, we had an amendment uh, to the TIP that is in process. We're having a public meeting here shortly. You'll hear about that as well. Uh, socioeconomic forecasting, we mentioned that. We are going to visit many of you, and I think some of you have already responded to our request for meetings here in the next couple of weeks um, to build on our traffic model forecast. And um, we talked about the Kite Award, which was awarded in November, that was, uh, was received by New Albany for their one-way, two-way conversion with the runner-up being uh, the Lovello project with Louisville Metro and the joint project KYTC and Louisville Metro, the uh, roundabout in Fairdale. Great. Any questions for Larry? All right. Uh, fourth item on the agenda is the public comment period. If there are any members of the public that wish to address the uh, TTCC, uh, please feel free to stand up and do so. Anybody? Going once, going twice. Okay, on to our next item. Um, performance management update, uh, Amanda, and action is requested on this item, correct? Yes, thank okay. you. Good afternoon, everybody. Today I will be discussing updates to our performance management plan, specifically focusing on the federally mandated performance measures addressing safety. We'll go ahead and let this load. All right. First, we'll do a, a brief overview of performance management at KIPTA. As you recall, KIPTA developed our own performance management plan, which was adopted in August of 2015, <coughs> and we do have it posted on our Connecting Kentuckiana website. The link is right there. Uh, the PMP is a subset of Connecting Kentuckiana, the MTP that we currently have under development. And the purpose of this plan is to be the tool that we use to report performance management, um, our baselines, targets, and our progress for achieving those targets. We are gearing up to review and update the performance management plan this spring since it's been a few years since we've edited it. Um, so be looking for that pretty soon. Next we'll do an overview of the federally required performance measures. Um, this was first required by MAP21 and then continued by the FAST Act. Um, MAP21 first said that we had MPOs had to start taking a performance-based 
planning um, approach. So we went ahead and got the ball, ball rolling by doing that. However, um, when we adopted the performance management plan in 2015, the final rules for the federally required performance measures were not yet out. So we will need to be modifying the plan to incorporate the final rules of those federally mandated ones. There are both FHWA and FTA required performance measures, and today we'll be focusing on the safety performance measures that FHWA requires called PM1. There are FTA ones. Um, we do have to incorporate the transit performance measures in our planning documents by October 1st of this year, and we are in the process of coordinating with TARP to make sure that we do meet that deadline. Those will be discussed at a later date. So moving on to the FHWA performance measures. Again, PM1 is the safety that we're going to be focusing on today. There are five performance measures under those. Number of fatalities, fatality rate, number of serious injuries, the serious injury rate, <coughs> and the number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries combined. The next performance measures from FHWA are PM2, asset management, where they address pavement condition and bridge condition. And PM3, system performance, which addresses things like congestion, travel time, reliability, and emissions reductions. And so for PM2 and 3, the deadline to uh, set targets for those, for MPOs, is November of this year. So we will be discussing those in length at a later date sometime this fall. Again, we're just talking about PM1 today. So key implementation dates for PM1, the safety performance measures. First, the final rule was effective of April of 2016. So that was obviously after 2015 when we adopted our PMP. So we need to modify our PMP to incorporate these. By the end of last August 2017, our state DOTs, KYTC and NDOT, had to report their state targets, their 2014 to 2018 safety targets, which um, they have to set every summer. Um, both states did set their targets, and they gave those targets to us in October of last year. What we're doing today is the meeting the requirement for MPOs to set their targets. Uh, we have to set our targets by February 27th later this month, and then we get a chance to set targets every year. Just like the states have to set their targets every summer, by the end of February we have to set our targets every year. So that's what we're proposing today. Um, there is no formal requirement for MPOs to report our targets to directly to FHWA. Only the states have to, re have to report directly to FHWA. So what we're doing, hopefully this month, with TTCC's recommendation of proposed targets, TPC's approval of targets, um, we will then report those targets to both of our state DOTs in order to be in compliance with the FAST Act. That's the only requirement that we have to do for reporting. Um, by May 27th of this year, any <coughs> update or amendment to our MTP and TIP must incorporate PM1. We are fully anticipating doing that. Um, what we're planning to do is have both documents reference our targets, reference performance measures, but again, the performance management plan, that document itself will be the primary document used to report our performance measures, our baselines, our targets, so that way we can make adjustments to that plan and leave the MTP and TIP. Um, not make as many changes regarding performance measures to those documents. Later this summer, early this summer, KIPTA is planning to develop a long-range 2040 target for our NTP um, in preparation of project development for Connecting Kentuckiana. That target is going to be very ambitious, very aspirational. Um, again, we're talking about safety targets. So, of course, in a perfect world, we would love to stand here and say, we want to see zero fatalities on our roadways. Um, and so we are going to be developing an aspirational target that's getting us towards zero for 2040. So please keep that in mind today when we talk about our 2014 to 2018 targets. Those numbers are going to be higher than what our 2040 target will be. Uh, another key implementation date, by April of next year, all serious injuries must be classified using nationally uniform criteria. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that later um, because we do have issues between the states on how they classify serious injuries. So by next year, all states nationwide have to use the same classification. Lastly, spring of 2020 is when FHWA will notify the state DOTs if they've met or made significant progress towards meeting their targets. 
again, FHWA will not be, um, we will not be reporting to them directly. They will not be looking at the NPOs and, and assessing whether or not we've made progress at that time, but we do anticipate tracking our progress, reporting that to our state DOTs in order to help them report their progress as necessary. Even though there's no formal reporting requirement, we do anticipate FHWA at some point will probably ask us what our targets are, what our progress is, probably at federal certification review. So again, we're going to have all of this information for them. Okay, so the MPO requirements, that we've had two options. The final rules say we can either commit to supporting the state's targets in which we would agree to plan programs uh, and projects that contribute towards achieving the state's targets. However, how can we support both of our states when they have different targets? So that leads into number two. Our second option was we could set our own targets. And as soon as we knew that we could set our own targets, we decided to go that route. We wanted to use a data-driven approach. Um, we looked back at our goals and objectives of connecting Kentucky and our MTP under development. And safety is a huge priority. So we thought by going above and beyond and setting our own targets that that would be a good way of addressing safety, directly addressing safety um, in the MPO region. As far as I understand it, we are the only MPO in both Indiana and Kentucky that have set their own targets. I think if I'm correct, all the other MPOs in both of those states have gone with option one and just committed to supporting the state's targets. So that's something to be proud of, I think. There are a few requirements of us. We do have to incorporate the entire metropolitan planning area. So these are full five county, um, Clark and Floyd in Indiana, Jefferson, Bullitt, and Oldham in Kentucky. We have one target for all five of those counties. We have numbers and figures for each county individually, but for the purposes of reporting to our state DOTs, it's one KIPTA NPO number. Again, we must set our targets annually. We must track our progress towards achieving them. Uh, we must report our targets to our state DOTs every year. And again, we must have um, be ready to report our targets and our progress to FHWA whenever it was requested. Um, the burden is on the state DOTs to make progress. There are no punishments or rewards for failing or meeting your targets at the MPO level. There are um, consequences for the state DOTs if they do not meet their targets. So we want to set realistic targets in order to help our state DOTs help meet their goals. And we are a bi-state MPO, so we do face a few issues that other MPOs do not face. Um, I already touched on one earlier. How do we set targets that support both of our states when they have two different approaches to setting targets? I'll go into a little bit later on the two different approaches that both of our states used. We also struggled with how do we set a target that adequately addresses all five of our counties. Of course, Jefferson County having Louisville Metro being our biggest city in our region, anything that happens in that county um, if there's more fatalities in, in one year in that county, that's going to affect the region as a whole. But we cannot forget the issues that face our smaller counties as well. We also have multiple data sources um, that we have to balance between. We have the ARIES crash database that we download our Indiana database um, crash information from. It's password protected. We have the KSP Kentucky database where we, it's publicly available. Um, anybody can get on there and download crash information. We struggled a bit because that database does not have information on serious injuries, and three out of the five of our performance measures address serious injuries. So until January, until last month, we did not have information in Kentucky on serious injuries. Um, KYTC has signed an MOU with Kentucky State Police, access, giving them access to the serious injury data. So two of us at KIPTA have signed a, an extension of that MOU in order to have limited access to that data. However, we're at the mercy of KYTC to send us that data. It's not a database. We can't get on and access it and query it any time we want. They have to send us that. So we're missing historical data. We're missing 2017 that just finished. They haven't sent us that yet. So it, we're kind of limited on, on what we can use on, on some of our data sources. And lastly, or something called FARS, the final FARS, is what we have to use to calculate fatalities nationwide. So if we have um, 65 fatalities and listed in one year 
from our one of our state crash databases, but FARS has listed a different number, we have to use the FARS number instead. And there have been a few inconsistencies, so it's just a struggle to make sure that you're checking all these different databases to make sure you have the correct data. We also must estimate our VMT, or vehicle miles traveled, in order to set our fatality rate and our serious injury rate, performance targets. And we do have differences in quality of data between the two states. Um, this is mainly referencing the classification of serious injuries in Indiana. That change, that definition changed in 2014. Um, essentially what, it, what happened in 2014, they started classifying, police reports started classifying serious injuries as anybody who got an ambulance after a crash. So even if you're just complaining that your neck hurt, got an ambulance, that police um, person wrote down that it was a serious injury. That resulted in, let me look at these numbers. Um, in 2013, we had, I had it written down somewhere. Um, I think it was 65 injuries in both of our Indiana counties, 65 serious injuries in Clark and Floyd County in 2013. In 2015, we had 830. And that was not due to more people getting in serious injury crashes. That was just due to a reporting error. So, again, that goes back to tw April 2019, everybody in the, in the nation has to report their serious injuries on the CAB code scale. They all have to do A as an incapacitating injury. But until that time, what do we do with 2014 to the present in Indiana, our serious injuries? Um, so that's something we struggled with as well. <clears throat> all right, so this is the Kentucky DOT approach to target setting, and this is our interpretation of it. I don't want to put words in their mouth. Um, I've oversimplified it a little bit. Um, essentially, KYTC has set their targets at their baseline. So your baseline is 2012 to 2016 five-year rolling average. KYTC essentially says statewide our targets, our 2014 to 2018 target is to do no worse than what our baseline was for all five of their performance measures, which is aggressive because fatalities have gone up, serious injuries have gone up, um, and they have made it very clear that they want to do no worse than their baseline. So that's one approach, simplified. The Indiana approach was a little more complicated because statewide they had to deal with that serious injury issue I was just talking about. So what they did was they calculated that 7.2% of all injuries were serious injuries. So in the years leading, leading up to 2014 with that definition change, they calculated, that was when the raw data was correct, they calculated that 7.2% of all injuries were serious injuries. So for the years where the data was inflated, they had to adjust their numbers. They just took serious injuries times 7 point, or total injuries times 7.2% in order to get their serious injury numbers. In Indiana, NDOT decided to set their targets slightly higher than what they projected their 2014-2018 five-year rolling average. So at the time, last summer, when they set their targets, they had full data for 2014, 15, and 16. They projected the remainder of 17, projected the 18 using a trend line. They got that five-year rolling average, and they set theirs slightly higher than what their 2014 to 2018 projected trend line would be. They made adjustments for other factors, including increasing VMT. The more people there are on the road, the more opportunity there are for people to get into crashes and decreasing unemployment. They did some very technical analysis that correlated a decreasing employment to an actual increase in traffic collisions. So the KIPTA approach, we waited until we had both states' approaches. Until last fall, we didn't know what the state's targets were, what their methodology was. We waited until we had our full data for 2017. So we had four out of the five years that we could download. And it's still preliminary. Um, we had listed a certain number of fatalities. The final FARS data on 2017 won't come out for another year and a half. So it is still preliminary, but it's a very good observation. So what we decided to do was address our serious injuries issues in Indiana this, using the same methodology that, it, that NDOT used. Um, they had vetted it with NHTSA and FHWA, that methodology, and the, both of those agencies signed off on it and said, given the unique circumstance, this was an appropriate way to calculate your serious injuries. So we used the same methodology, and we actually got 6.5%. From 2009 to 2013, when the, da when the raw data was good, 6.5% of all injuries were serious injuries, which is lower than the statewide average of 72 
So we adjusted our serious injury starting in 2014 times that amount. We ended up going with the trend line approach to target setting because it's data driven. It's similar to the Indiana approach. They had vetted their methodology with those two agencies and they signed off on it. Um, we had to wait, because we had to wait for our serious injury data from KYTC until last month. Because of that, when we were, kept, when we were doing all of this, we had four full years of data. So we have to set a target from 2014 to 2018, but 2014 to 2017 are already in the bag. You can't change those numbers. So all we really needed to do was project what 2018 was going to be, which we did using a trend line, and then that's what we set all of our targets for, for all five of our safety performance measures. All right, so let's dive right into the data. Now let me orient you to this slide. It's going to have a lot of information on there for you. First, we're going to have a graph. The green line and the green dots at the top are KIPTA as a whole, all five counties combined. And the, these are the numbers that we're reporting to our state DOTs. We're tracking our Kentucky counties and our Indiana counties also, but the green lines, the green numbers, are what we're actually reporting. The green glow around those dots are the five years that make up our 2014 to 2018 target. And then the ye little yellow dots there at the end are a 2018 projected, um, what we project 2018 to be in the green line. The blue line is our three Kentucky counties. And our red line and the red dots are our two Indiana counties. So essentially it's the red dots plus the blue dots equals the green dots. If that makes sense to you. <coughs> this is our number of fatalities from 2008 to 2017. Next we have the raw data that went into creating this graph from 2005 to 2017. Those are actual data that we've downloaded from those crash databases. And 2018 <coughs> are projected numbers. And here highlighted and kind of the yellow and the orange are our five years that make up our 2014 to 2018 target. Now, the blue up here, the 100 and 112 in 2012 and 2013, that, those numbers make up part of our baseline. So 2012 to 2016 is our baseline. Those blue numbers are rolling off. And the orange numbers at the bottom, 2017, 2018, they're rolling on. So the numbers that are rolling off are 100 and 112. Those are relatively low numbers. 100 is a relatively no, low number of fatalities, given that since 2005, our lowest number of fatalities was 93 in 2009 when we had a relatively low VMT. So 2017, um, when we downloaded the data in late January, the, the number of fatalities was 150. That's the highest it's been since 2005. So low numbers are rolling off, high numbers are rolling on. You can't argue with those last four numbers, or I'm sorry, the first four numbers. Those years are already in the bag. So the only thing that could potentially change is the 138 that we have projected in 2018. So that's why our targets seem pretty high, because we're incorporating those five years of numbers, and four of them are already done. And unfortunately, it looks like we're trending up in our fatalities. We're trending a little up on some of these things. So lastly, these are our baselines and targets together on one graph at, or one table at the bottom. We have our Kentucky <coughs> three-county MPO. Our baseline was 97.4. Our target, I shouldn't really call it our target, our projected, what we expect to happen with our four completed years plus our projected 2018 years, 110.2. 18.8 um, is Indiana's baseline. 21.2 is what we expect to happen. And that blue number there, 116.2, is our baseline. And then the yellow number is our target, which is what we would, we, which is one of the things that we're proposing today. The 131.4 fatalities is our 2014-2018 target. So if that, hopefully that all that makes sense to you. So now we're moving on to fatality rate. Same thing. Graph. Green is the KITA together. Um, blue is Kentucky on its own. Red is Indiana on its own. So Indiana has a pretty uh, low fatality rate, lower um, than Kentucky, which balances out. That's why the green is below the blue line. And same thing, the blue numbers here are rolling off our baseline average. These orange numbers at the bottom are rolling on. Our fatality rate was 1.32 in 2017, which is almost the highest it's been since 2005. It's, it was 1.34 in 2005. So 
we're seeing some pretty high numbers, so it makes sense that what we're projecting, our target, would be a little bit higher as well. And the target for this that we're proposing is 1.17 for our fatality rate for the whole region. Our serious injuries is actually going down. Um, the trend line is going down. Um, we're missing a few years here, if you look in the blue line, the Kentucky line, we're missing a few years here that we have in Indiana because, like I said earlier, we're at the mercy of KYTC sharing the serious injury information with us. And they didn't send us those years, so we could only use the information that we had. So we set the trend line and set our targets based on those years that we had. And we're actually trending down in this one. Our baseline is 892.9, but our target is 859.4 for serious injuries, number of serious injuries in the entire Kipta region. And of course, the rate reflects the number as well. The baseline for the entire region is 8.18, and the target is going down at 7.66. <clears throat> and lastly, the non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries combined. Um, again, <clears throat> we're missing a few years of data because we are at the mercy of KYTC sharing it with us. Um, this is going up slightly. The baseline was 102.46, and the target is 110.1. So this is all of the baselines and targets together on one graph. I know you guys um, in the memo and in the packet today, you had the targets. Those are the ones highlighted in yellow. Those are the targets that we are proposing today that we will be asking for approval of today. Um, but this is in context with the Kentucky and Indiana baselines and targets there separately, all together. All right, so what are our next steps? Well, first, like I said in the beginning of the presentation, we need to update our performance management plan to incorporate all of the federally required ones. Um, we had a feeling we knew what the federal ones were when we first adopted the plan, but we weren't totally on the, on the mark. So we have to update that to incorporate PM1. Um, prior to February 27th, we have to report our targets to our state DOTs. Um, we're going to review and update our KIP to develop performance measures this spring. So the performance measures that go above and beyond what the feds require of us, we're going to do an update soon. And then by November of 2018, we have to report PM2, our asset management, and PM3, our system performance, the congestion ones. So this fall, we'll be coming to you doing the same presentation again, focusing on PM2 and 3. Um, and also can't forget the transit ones we have to incorporate by October 1st. So we'll be coming to you talking about the transit ones as well. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, we have to incorporate the performance measures in our main planning documents, our MTP and our TIP. These are the deadlines for those. May 27th, October 1st, November 16th. So we're planning to be um, meet all those deadlines. We'd like to develop a process for regular reporting to you guys, both to you and um, our state DOTs and the public. Um, we would like to develop a process for coming to you, reporting our targets, having a discussion on what our targets should be because we have to set our targets every year. So we're standing here today talking about our 2014 to 2018 targets in 2018. We have to set our 2015 to 2019 targets by February of 2019, but there's nothing stopping us from going ahead and starting that discussion now and then also talking about our 16 to 20 targets. You know, we can, we can maybe get ahead of this, get some long-term trends going. Um, so we'd like to develop a process of and formalizing that through our performance management plan of how we're going to do all that. <coughs> Again, we'd like to develop a long-range target for our MTP, the Horizon Year 2040. Um, we'll be doing that this summer. And then we also need to start tracking our progress towards achieving our targets. Now that we've set a target, or we're about to set a target, we're going to start tracking our progress towards achieving our targets and come up with methodologies on how we'd like to see those targets met. You know, come up with projects, programs. So that's something important to, that we need to focus on too. Again, in one year, we'll be right back here, or before, um, reporting our 2015 to 2019 targets as well. All right, so that was my presentation. I'm requesting two recommendations from TTCC today. The first one is to re recommend approval of the PM1 safety targets that are listed in your memo in your agenda packet. The second one is to recommend permission to add the FHWA required performance measures to our performance management plan. 
and then we'll add the FTA ones at a later date. So those are the two actions we're looking for today. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Whenever you uh, put out your uh, goals here, like why would you uh, have your number of fatalities, your number of serious injuries, and your number of non-motorized fatalities as decimals rather than round those to the sure. nearest number? That's just what the final rules require. The final rules for the FHWA performance measures um, list out the decimal place that you have to. Okay. When they start doing the math, basing them on the rolling averages of whole numbers, mm -hmm. you end up with with the decimal. Right. And they're asking so it's either an over and under. You're not going to hit it, but you may get over. You may get under. And that's the thing. When the when FHWA. I get it with the rate. Right. The sure. rate mm -hmm. you're going to have a decimal. It's kind of hard to have a of fatality. Yeah. You can't have a half a person die. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, it's confusing. Um, or you could lose a limb. You can call that a third, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep in mind. <laughs> I guess that'd be a serious injury, right? Um, you have to keep in mind, too, that when FHWA um, assesses whether or not the state DOT is not the MPO, meets their targets, um, what they're really looking for is assessment towards meeting their target. So they're looking for either you met your baseline, or you met your target, which is why it's a little hard that KYTC set their baseline at their target because they have that one number that they're looking for. If you have your baseline here and set your target a little higher and you didn't meet your target but you met your baseline, then they're going to call that you made significant progress. So it, I don't think they're going to be sticklers over a, a few decimal points. I, I don't anticipate they will be released. Yes? Go ahead, Eric. Amanda will tell you I called her yesterday to discuss these because I'm a big advocate of trying to figure out how we can reduce our fatalities. I started looking since 2006 through 10 when I got in metro government. And in 2016, we had never had more than 90 fatalities from 2006 through 15. And all of a sudden in 16, we went up to 99 fatalities. Now last year, 2017, we're at 109 fatalities. So we blew right on into triple digits. And I really want to be aggressive with these goals and targets. <clears throat> Amanda talked me down off the shelf. But I, I will applaud the fact that the rate of fatalities is what I'm looking at for vehicle miles traveled and focused on. And that's what the feds are asking us to focus on. The more urbanized areas have a lower fatality rate. And so as rural as Kentucky is, and if we had adopted the Kentucky standard for that rate, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been a target at all, and we're well within what I think is uh, their rate is 1.5 for the baseline. Mm -hmm. Indiana, on the other hand, they're their baseline for five years for the entire state is 1.00. So what they're doing in Indiana, we need to figure that out in a hurry because they're well ahead of Kentucky. And we've got, we've all got to improve our game and, and try to get these numbers down. So with that said, I want to, I want to make a motion that we accept the targets established by Kipton. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, you got a motion on the floor. So oh, no, I'll second that's it. Why. So can have a okay, yeah. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Church just rolls right into that motion without <laughs> any more questions. <laughs> I have a question. So then, is this something that moving forward with projects we're going to start looking at is the impact it's going to have in regards to meeting these goals? Is that, I mean, is it, and I assume especially on the HSIP projects, but on all projects, is that something that you guys are going to start to incorporate into <coughs> the overall application and, and part of that. Is that the next step, I guess, in this? That's something we haven't really finalized yet um, on how we're actually going to correlate this project directly with um, the performance targets. Um, it's a little bit behind the scenes. Um, I know you guys are aware of our performance, or I'm sorry, our project evaluation process where um, we're proposing that in, through Connecting Kentuckiana, in order to get a new project in, you have to get evaluated. And that evaluation is taken directly from the federal performance measures. It's also taken directly from our KIPTA developed performance measures. 
So it's kind of behind the scenes in that we grade how well a project is meeting our performance measures. But it, it's been thrown out that we might like to more directly put some sort of requirements or reporting on these projects are, are safety projects and they are meeting our safety performance targets. Um, we haven't really worked out the kinks on that yet, but that you're, you're on the right track. Can I, 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 my, I, I guess you, you might have to talk me off the shelf here too. Because <clears throat> I, I I'm wondering if there's no penalty for us to have a lower number, why are we aiming for a higher number? I mean, we had, I, I think if that's the accurate number, 109, then we did a better job killing people on our roads than we did with violence in Jefferson County this year. So, I mean, that's a pretty sad state of affairs for us. So, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that we can probably do more about the roadway fatalities than we can about the, the violence in the community. So I, I guess my question is, is what is the danger of going to the, with the, a lower number? And I agree that the rate's probably more important than the The biggest number. danger is you're going to miss it horribly. Yeah. Because we're already into 18. Right. We have the other years of the rolling average already, as you said, in, in the bag. I mean, what you're going to do is you're going to set an unrealistically low number. We're, we're trying to hit that trend line, even though it's not desirable. But if you can keep that trend stable, because it has been going for a while now. Right. Um, as going forward, though, looking 20 years from now, we're going to set something that's a whole lot more aggressive. Right. And when you set that target, too, from our perspective and the things that we can do as an MPO, we can't really affect that number in this short period of time. Not the so, first number. The 2014 not, right. to 2018 number, right. we can't have much of an impact on for now. Right. And, and, and you can't build yourself out of it. Right. right. And, and I think it's important to, 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 do, to note the difference between targets, which is kind of what we expect to happen, and our goal. Our long-term goal, our MTP goal, will be an ambitious, we want to see, we want to be towards zero deaths. Um, so we will set a, an ambitious goal, but a realistic goal also. Um, but, but the targets today are what we reasonably expect to happen on our roads. Um, and we're going to try to start, you know, I'm talking about next year, the 2015 and 19 targets, when we do have a little bit, if we start that discussion a little earlier, maybe we can have more time to have more impact on those last two years to lower that target. Well, I guess this is this is my concern, and I know I get the difference between the goal and, and the number, and I know that we're not going to be able to correct what happened last year, the year before, ten years before. But I mean, I think that I, I you know, the the number being higher today than it was four years ago speaks to the fact, and you know, this is why we sit in this room is to prioritize our transportation investments, and clearly, uh, if we're not making safety our number one priority, I mean, we're going to continue to you know, we're going to continue to fail at, um, you know, keeping people alive on the roads. I mean, I, this is, uh, I, you know, I, I, I just, I think that, you know, we have, this is the trend that the country's going, I mean, you look at other, or we look at, I know that we're, we've got a lot of other situations here, but I think we look at other big cities that are similar to us and their fatalities are much lower than ours. So I think we've may, we're starting to look at really spending dollars to make the intersection improvements. Because I'd actually argue we can't build our way out of the past, but we can certainly address the concerns and try to reduce those things happening in the future. So right. I mean, if we're going to go with the target that's higher, and I'm, you know, I'm, I don't know that I, how I really feel about this, and I'm going to have to soul search here in the next three minutes. But um, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, it, it speaks you know, the next time we have to do it, we're going to have to do, be back here in a year looking at this number. And I think the big question for this group is we're going to set a goal in an MTP that's going to be towards zero deaths, but we're going to continue to raise our target as the, as the fatality numbers come in. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's going to start to look bad for us. So I just, you know, we're not, we're not going to meet our goals. So I, I think that you know, if this number is going to play into how we're going to score projects in the future mm -hmm. or how we're going to, you know, look at, you know, prioritize projects in the future, then I think that we need to be looking at a number that's damn closer to zero than 131. That's just 
Sorry, that's just my opinion on it. Well, the, the, the whole idea of this and, and the whole idea of performance management is to do better than that target. Right. I, I, understand, I get that, but I just I, I, I think the number's high. That's just that's my opinion, and I'm one voice on it's, this committee. So it's uh, it's very high, unfortunately. But there there's not a lot of impact that we can make um, in the region in the next year, uh, right? Because it's a lot of it's out of our hands here. A lot of it is education. A lot of it is leave your phone in your pocket. Um, what we really things that do. that we really need to to look at more than just a roadway improvement. What we really want to do with these targets, these yearly targets, is slowly turn the barge around. I don't think we're going to be able to do a, a, something massive in one year right. to have an effect. And so this first year, it's a high number. It, and and when, you, when you think about it, it's not just 131, it's 131 fatalities. They, these are real people's lives. It's, it's really sad to think about this. So it is a high priority. Um, but realistically, how fast can we turn that barge around? And so we want, to, we want to decrease the increase. We want to slow down the rate that it's increasing. And then once we start slowing it down and stabilize it, maybe we can start turning it around and start seeing a decrease. Yeah. Um, and that's going to take a little longer than this year, maybe even next year. Well, I, I, and I, I get all that. I just I look at the trend lines, and I, I see, uh, now then I'm going to get to Jonah, so sorry. I, I see that the trend lines are going up, and I, I agree that there is this linear growth, but I think if you look at what's happened in the numbers in the region in the last three years, you were starting to see the exponential growth. And, that's, and, that's, and that's a real challenge. And my, I guess my question is, 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 is there something, and I know we're not going to do anything in the next year. I totally agree with that. I understand that. But I just I think that we should just be a little bit more critical of that. And as, I think as we look at projects, we should in prioritizing projects, we should be thinking about that, Jim. Sorry. Well, I, I, I don't know how to associate any of these numbers with what we're actually doing in the next few months. Right. You know, I, I, are we doing education? Are we doing it safety improvements? And, and so... Uh, that's, saying, a, that's okay, a great point. You know, it, so that, but that's our job. Yes. Right. That's what our job is in the next projection. That's where we really need to focus. Right. So for this 2018, you know, I, I understand and hear and agree with everything you're saying, but I, don't, I can't associate it with what are we actually doing. And I think this needs to be an eye-opening experience of yeah. the, the numbers, the, the last four years, we can't change those. Those are in the bag. So what do we do? And we're upset by seeing these numbers. We don't like these numbers. We're and that's one reason why the safety performance measures were the very first ones right. to be approved. So we, that critical to everyone. This, this needs to be eye-opening to us that we don't like these numbers. We're setting these targets. We don't like these targets, though. So let's start doing something to come up with plans and projects and programs that address this. But I think we set very ambitious goals. We did. And, and, and that's what we're really going to focus on now, take what the goals are, and then, like Amanda was saying, reverse that trend, get the barge going in the right direction. Right. I mean, this is the first time that we've done this. This is where we start. This is our baseline. And, and we go from here. I guess that, that plays into my question, Larry. Uh, have we dived into creating heat maps and whatnot on where the fatalities exist? Yes. And all the conditions around those fatalities. And yes, and all that's going to all that's going to be rolled into our, our project selection okay. and project development if, if as you, we go forward. If you recall, we okay. actually do have a high crash location maps. Um, right. We haven't really. I was, I was wondering if we're combining these two so that we're. Yeah, connected yes. that yeah that's kind of the next step. Yes. Um, we have these high crash location maps, but, but we haven't done where fatalities are occurring, um, what's causing these crashes. You know, that's kind of a next step, next level um, okay. analysis. And, and that's kind of. You're, yeah, you're, you're right on track with what we're planning to do next. And one of the things we're going to do is provide that information to all of you through our website, too. So even though it's not something that you bring to this table for funding, it may be something that you can do with your own forces. You can, you can put a signal in, whether there's a stop sign now or, or whatever, where you see those locations. Right. Sound or lighting or something. Mm -hmm. Right. OK, so we have a motion and a second. Do we have any other questions or discussions? There's none. Uh, we have the motion is to uh, accept the, uh, the targets as presented by the KIPTA staff. Uh, Dirk motion, Jim seconded. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? All right. Um, so, uh, second item that they're asking for is to add the performance measures to uh, our performance management plan. And is there going to be a subcommittee that's looking at that before? 
Um, we probably will come up with a subcommittee. Um, okay. For this time, all we're doing is adding the PM1 performance measures, PM2 and 3, the ones, the final rules that have already been required. Um, but when we review and update the KIPP to develop performance measures this spring, we probably will be coming to you asking for a subcommittee. Okay. This is a document that's already been developed and yeah. already been developed and already has come through this committee. Right. Yeah. Just an amendment. Right. Okay. So any questions on this on this item? Can I get a motion? Again, this is to uh, add the to amend the performance management plan with the PM one, two, and three. Okay, keep Second. that. Direct seconds. Any questions? Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Good deal. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Amanda. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda, Aida is going to tell us about the uh, Riverport circulator. Thank you, Larry. It's always nice to talk about new service. It doesn't happen very often, but we do have this opportunity to uh, provide a little bit more information about projects that you are already familiar with, but it's um, now up and running. Uh, to set the stage, I would like to share with you a little bit more information about how we did in the past fiscal year. And uh, basically our, our service, uh, really the most important function is providing access to places and opportunities across the community. In the last fiscal year, we provided 12.5 million boardings system-wide, uh, more than 4, 41,000 uh, boardings on an average weekday. And we do have now 43 routes in five counties in two states. Our fleet has um, below 230 buses. That does include 33 hybrid, 15 all electric, and plus we have 102 paratransit vehicles. We now have 645 team members on the TARC, uh, uh, in the TARC organization, and uh, important to mention that almost 70% of TARC trips are provided for jobs and education. Planning for Riverport uh, Circulator started almost three years ago. In early 2015, we tried to address uh, basic needs of access to jobs and education in uh, southwestern Jefferson County, Riverport, uh, Jefferson Community and Technical College, Valley Station. So we do have service there for decades, uh, providing half-hour service all day long, express service, some other cross-town routes. But Riverport area as major employment centers wasn't really served properly. We started with analysis of employment and population density and submitted SEMA grant applications two times in 2015 and 2016. Throughout this process, we really had a strong support and partnerships with the community. More than anything, Riverport businesses um, and business association always contact us for years during the peak employment seasons that they do not have enough connections um, for employees to accept uh, a temporary or permanent jobs, so that was a pain for many years. We also had support from many community organizations, especially Active Cloud, which is faith-based community organization dealing with various community issues. They were very supportive our elected officials as well, definitely KIPTA and KYTC having good understanding of needs in this area of the community and supporting CIMA grant, grant applications. Metro and many other organizations provided tons of support letters for this service. And finally, we were able to start actual planning. The grant was awarded um, last year, early summer, May, June 2017, and it was a really big news in the media. It got a lot of attention. We did have a great press conference in 90 degrees weather in June in Riverport. Um, and uh, basically the nuts and bolts of the projects are that for approximately 3.2 million, we could provide this service for three years. 
The actual grant was 2.5 million, 0.7 million would be provided by TARC local funding. Riverport Industrial um, Park does have 10,000 job opportunities and currently uh, below 7,000 employees and approximately 120 companies. This new circulator will significantly and actually already increases a uh, number of morning and evening trips to the Riverport area and Valley Station and Jefferson Community and Technical <coughs> College. It does have um, connecting routes in the area that together provides network to provide better service to the entire um, southwest uh, Jefferson County. After the press conference, we basically finalized the schedule and routing. We, we made some minor tweakings to the route and service originally planned in, in uh, 2016. We also had intense coordination with Riverport Businesses and Riverport Business Association. We communicated with them, looked into um, their various shifts. Obviously, the, the employment center operates at three different shifts almost all over the place, so we try to get a survey through a Riverport Business Association, get information, pull that together, and develop schedule that we implemented in early <coughs> November. And that was just in time for the peak employment season for this year. Service is really good. It's almost all day with a very short gap midday, and once again, that was based on communication with the Business Association. And uh, it's very new. It was implemented on November 6th, so the ridership is still to be established. And for every new service, it takes a lot of time, at least six months to a year, to establish ridership. So right now, um, obviously, November was not even full month. December was very, very good month for uh, employees and employers, and we had approximately 1,900 boardings total a month, which approximately was um, about 100 on an average weekday. Not much, and we plan to do much better promotion. Once again, contact <coughs> businesses to try to include information about service in their HR packages and, and start really um, this new year with hopefully strengthening the service that is now available um, to Riverport. We plan to do future schedule adjustments. We TARC typically has three times a year schedule adjustments. The next one is in June. We will uh, gather information and tweak it and address some of the needs of the Valley High School, um, JCDC College, and obviously um, Riverport businesses. This service does provide great connections to other TARC routes, and it will be a feeder for future bus rapid transit that should be um, running and operating in about a year and a half late next year, so basically we hope that this service will establish the core connectivity to BRT service. And also this um, Riverport Circulators um, was an opportunity to establish and form new partnerships. Uh, Jefferson Community and Technical College and Jefferson County Public Schools have new program for high school students to attend college classes at JCTC Southwest Campus, but there was no connection um, by transit, and that was a major deal for us. So we had a really great meeting with both entities, and uh, we also uh, TARC developed partnership with JCTC where their student can board TARC for free with their IDs. So obviously, this is much needed, and it's another opportunity to expand on education, literally, proving how transit support various community functions, especially for people who depend on transportation. So that would be it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Edith. Anybody have any questions? Great. Thanks. Good luck. Thank well, thank you. We soon plan to come with probably more information to the committee with uh, COA and Long Range Plan, which is another exciting well-supported project, and uh, hopefully sometimes mid this year, we'll be able to share more specifics. All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, next uh, item, um, Nick is going to give us an update on the uh, quarterly project review. Right. You, Nick? Yeah. All right. 
Hope everyone's uh, doing well this afternoon. Uh, today I am presenting the quarterly project review update. Um, this is essentially a snapshot in time of how well our project sponsors are implementing projects that have been awarded KIP to dedicated funds. Uh, the core purpose of this is really to increase accountability and transparency to the public. <coughs> uh, just a quick background for those who haven't been in the loop in the last couple of years. Uh, the project management process was adopted back in 2016 by the TPC. This policy and process allows for the planning, programming, and prioritization of federal funds um, to KIPTA. Uh, each quarter, project sponsors are required to submit uh, a progress report that basically indicates whether or not that project's on schedule and provides a little more detail about when, that, when those funds might be authorized or obligated. Um, additionally, each quarter, project sponsors can also submit phase shift applications. So in some cases, there's reasons why a project is not moving forward on schedule and needs to be pushed back a year. Um, and then lastly, there are uh, op some opportunities uh, during the year for cost increases as well as um, funding for brand new projects and new phases of existing projects. Um, this quarter was not one of those opportunities where we had funding available, um, so we'll just be talking about uh, phase shifts in the later presentations. <coughs> Uh, so, just a few points about the rules in terms of managing costs and schedules. Uh, project sponsors uh, may request additional funds for those phases uh, if the request is less than 20%. If it's over 20% of the original cost, then a, uh, that sponsor would need to present um, directly to the TPC and those would need to be approved explicitly. Um, below 20%, no problem, we'll approve those uh, without kind of a a special exception there. Um, in terms of managing schedules, again, you can move your one. You can use, sorry, you can move a phase back one year. You can only do that twice before you have to again re request an exception to TPC to do so. And then finally, there this isn't necessarily a part of the project management process, but in general, we have the CMAC congestion air uh, congestion mitigation air quality program HSIP TAP and CMAC. They're all actually part of a bigger block grant, and so up to 50% of each one of those programs can be transferred to another um, dedicated funding program. And there's an example of that later on in this presentation that I'll be asking your approval for. Um, so because we uh, kind of got fully implemented in this process, I would say late 2017, we didn't have an opportunity to come to you all and kind of give you a, a summary of how things went in 2017. Um, so I wanted to do that, and I'm going to start off with Indiana here. Um, this table provides uh, kind of a, an overview of what occurred. We've got four columns uh, for each of the four dedicated programs. And then on the left-hand columns, we've got the annual allocation of funds. That's the amount, amount we receive every year. And in some cases in Indiana, there's, there's what's called a prior year balance, and that's being phased out. But for now, we do have a small amount of funds that are carried over, but that's that's going to be going away. So I can say that for each one of these programs, all of the dollars that were allocated to us were actually obligated last year. And so you can see the bottom column or the bottom row, all, all the funds were obligated, therefore nothing <coughs> was sent back to, in, to NDOT. And that's important because in Kentucky, we have the opportunity to carry over funds from one year to the next. In Indiana, that doesn't apply except for this very nuanced uh, prior year balance rule. Um, if you want to know more about the prior year balance rule, let me know. So moving on to 2018 and how we're looking so far, we're about five months into the fiscal year for Kentucky and about seven for Indiana because of the differences <coughs> in fiscal years. Again, I've got the four programs listed in the far right columns. And you can see that uh, we've had an obligation so far of about uh, 1.5 million across the four programs, 400,000 in CMAC and about almost a million in STP. So that still leaves a pretty healthy balance of funds that need to be obligated this year. Uh, it looks like it's about maybe eight million. Um, but based on the quarterly progress reports that were submitted by the sponsors, it looks like we won't, we shouldn't have a problem obligating all those funds. Um, if something changes, that could impact this. Um, but I think based on the progress reports, we're pretty confident that we will not be sending any funds back to NDOT again this year. And again, just a quick note, there were no funds available uh, for cost increases this year. So what I'm presenting today are essentially just one 
uh, proposed phase shift. Um, so Floyd County has the Charlestown Road Corridor Complete Streets Project. Uh, here they're basically building sidewalks on both, along that roadway. One side. One side of the roadway. Thank you. Um, they are not quite ready to move forward with right of way, which was programmed in fiscal year 18. Typically in Indiana, if this were to occur and there wasn't another partner that was able to kind of swing in and help out and fill that gap, those funds would more than likely be lost to the region. But in this case, the town of Clarksville is actually have, having to advance uh, Riverside Drive reconstruction project from 2020 preliminary engineering up to 18. And so if we move uh, the right-of-way phase from 18 back to 2020 for Floyd County in this instance, um, Clarksville will step in and fill that gap in 2018 and make sure that no funds are lost. Um, so there are basically two actions here that I'm requesting uh, recommendation for TPC approval, and that is to move the right-of-way phase from 18 to 20. Those would be both the first and second sh sh uh, shifts for that phase. Any future shifts would need to be um, approved as an ex exception. And then in doing so, because of the Riverside Drive and the differences, it's not necessarily a CMAC eligible project. It, it could be maybe, but at this point it's STP, so we're going to be converting those funds as well. So at this point I'm asking for action on uh, the Indiana proposed changes, and these are the two-year funding shift of this Charlestown Road project and the conversion of funds uh, to STP dollars. Can we make one motion or do you want two motions on that? I think one motion is perfectly fine. Any questions, Nick? Do you have a motion? I'll make that motion. Okay, second. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to shift the phase one year and to uh, change the funding source from CMAC to STP. Right. All those in favor? Right. Any opposed? Great. Thank you all. All right, we're going to move on to Kentucky. So first, let's go back in time and take a look back at how things worked out in 2017 for Kentucky. Uh, there's a couple big differences in the information that I'm providing here in these tables versus what was provided in Indiana's. Two reasons for that. One is uh, that we cannot carry over or that we can carry over funds in Kentucky. And so, for instance, in the STP program, in 2017, we were actually only allocated about 18 to 19 million dollars, but we had 27 million programmed because we have a large carryover balance that has not been spent um, to date. So that is the more important number, I think, from the KIPTA staff perspective, because that says at the beginning of fiscal year 17, we anticipated 27 million dollars worth of projects being obligated. What actually occurred? was about a little less than, or a little greater than half, so about $15.3 million in projects were obligated. I think that that's still an improvement from <coughs> 16. However, we shifted $12 million in projects to future years because sponsors weren't quite ready or utility concerns, impacts came up, things like that. And similarly, in the TAP program, um, we only receive about a million, million and a half in allocation funds, but we had a carryover balance of about 4.4. In this case, we actually were able to spend uh, 1.3 and only shift about 3 million out. So this isn't the, the end of the world, but I do want to kind of bring up a couple points here because the reason why we implemented the, program man the project management process was to try to cut down on the amount of funds that we are carrying over from year to year, cut down on our balance. And so we've, we've done that. We've done better, but not quite where we need to be. So we've obligated about 55% 50, of the funds that were actually programmed. So out of the 27 million, 55%. We only uh, obligated about 83% of that 18 million that was allocated to us. So we actually increased our carryover balance by $3 million. Um, not, not good news. Um, so in 2018, we, just, we need to improve and we need to at least obligate as much as we are allocated in the region. Um, with TAP, it was a slightly different story. While we only obligated about 28% of the funds that were programmed, we obligated more than we receive in a year. So that is helping us catch up a little bit and reduce that carryover balance a bit. <clears throat> Any questions on this one? It's a little complicated. All right, looking at where we are this quarter. 
So at the beginning of 20, and that should be 2018, my apologies. At the beginning of fiscal year 2018, we had $43 million programmed for STP dollars. So far in five months, we've obligated about five um, and, and only shifted about less than a million. And based on the progress reports, it looks like we have, I would say the bulk of that $43 million seems to be scheduled for lettings in May to August. So everything seems to be backloaded in terms of our STP programming, in terms of getting those funds obligated and authorized. So there's some concern there for us, um, but we'll monitor that each quarter and work with the sponsors. In the TAP program, we haven't had any obligations yet, but based on the progress reports, I think we'll well exceed what we did last year. Um, so again, the big pictures are, for STP, we've, we need to at least obligate as much as we receive this, this fiscal year. So that, that number is about $19.1 million. To reduce our carryover balance, we need to spend a lot more, or obligate a lot more funding than that. In the TAP program, it's about $1.2 million. And that's extremely important because we had a late start on implementing the TAP program, and so we're kind of behind the ball a bit. We have to spend at least $1.2 million or else we will lose the difference, and those will go back to USDOT. So we're monitoring all that. That's why we have this project management process in place and these quarterly progress reports. Next, I'll move on to um, final point here. Again, we didn't have any funds available for cost increases, but we did have four uh, proposed phase shifts. So uh, four Louisville Metro projects, all kind of related to the Louisville Loop. Um, each one of these projects has between one and three phases that are shifting out uh, one year. In all of these cases, it's the first time that these phases have been shifted out. Um, so unless anyone has any questions at this point, I'm requesting TTC action to recommend TPC approval of these four projects listed above that are shifting phases to future years. And I can take questions if there are questions as well. Any questions? Okay, we get a motion to uh, recommend the TPC. Anybody? Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? I would, I would like to say one thing before you vote. Um, the Indiana partners know this circumstance because it's been four years now, five years, I guess, that we've had to do this. NDOT elected to put a deadline on that carryover. You had to have it all spent by the end of 2018. Well, now they've extended it to 19. And in Indiana, what we have to do on an annual basis is spend the annual allotment or we lose it. We don't want to be in a position where the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet does the same thing. And it could happen. Times are, are pretty tight. Money is very tight. Uh, we really need to move these projects and, and start spending down that balance. As, as, as hard as you can work on these projects to try to get them obligated, please, please do. Okay. We have a motion, a second. Any other discussion or questions? Uh, okay. With that, uh, take a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you, Walter. Okay. I'm getting retired here. <laughs> Item 8, uh, uh, Coordinating Committee uh, 2018 Officers. Larry? Yes, uh, we have a situation here where we had selected a group for a nominating committee, but we never got together. So we have two options. Well, we have a lot of other options, but two options that are obvious are we take nominations from the floor here today and have an election, or we put that nominating committee to work and have our election at the next meeting. It's the pleasure of the committee. Which way we go? What do y'all want to do? <laughs> They're all very quiet today. Yeah. No, no, no. I volunteered to be on the committee. I'll still be on the committee if it wants to. Okay. Be. You want to do that? Go through the the legitimate process of okay. the nominating committee and have an election next time. Okay. Okay. So, so I didn't get retired. You have one more time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. This is this is not a, this is this is fun. <laughs> Um, okay. Do we, we'll need, do, that do, we, do we need action on that? No, or no, we okay. do not. Okay. So we'll set up a meeting and we'll get that nominating committee together. Yes. Okay. 
Um, right after this, can we meet right after this meeting? Certainly. Yeah. I'm open to that. Is everyone here? I don't know who else was on that. Who else was on that? Not me. No one. To get together. It's you and Larry and someone. There were three. I don't remember who the other. Who the other was? Yeah, there you go, Matt. Okay. We can do that. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is the draft fiscal year 19 unified planning work program. Yes, the draft document goes out to all of our planning partners at the end of the month. The unified planning work program is the document where we set forth all of the things that KIPTA is going to do in the next year with our planning funds. It's a document that has to be um, reviewed by both states and approved by Federal Highways and FTA so we can get our federal and state planning funds on an annual basis. Um, I'm going to send all of you and TPC a link to that document. It's about 60 pages long for your review or comment. We have to send it to them by the end of the month. Uh, the uh, TPC will uh, re review the draft and, and make improvement on the draft. So if you have any comments, once you see that document, please send them to me and I will incorporate those comments and take it to uh, TPC, which is next week. It's a short month, so we're, we're right on top of you. But I'll send all of you a link for review. All right, all right, so be looking for, forward for that link, and I know you're waiting on something for me for that. Yes. So. <laughs> which I just wanted. Are there any major changes comparing with the previous version or the any no, there, typically there are not major changes. There's incorporation of performance management, okay. There's mention of your COA, things like that, that, that we change from year to year. Nothing major. Um, we do have other business. Yes. yes, okay. So this will be very brief because I see everyone kind of wanted to get on for a day. Um, so this is just a brief update on the Unified Planning Work Program. So as some of you know, and as Larry mentioned when we first started here today, we are updating our 2040 socioeconomic forecast. And we're finishing that up, and while we're in the process of that, we're reaching out to all of you to kind of give us your local input on some of our numbers and see if anything needs to be adjusted as you see fit. So we've been sending out some meeting emails and meeting times and dates, and we have three set up so far, which are Bullet, Oldham, and four counties. So today, at the end of this week, we're sending those counties that we already have set up some um, meeting info to kind of familiarize yourself with what we'll be showing you. Um, in Clark and Jefferson County, we'll should be sending out your um, meeting invitations at the end of this week or the beginning of next. So just keep a lookout for that type of stuff, and we really look forward to getting y'all's feedback on what we've been working on for the past several months. That's all I've got. Anything else? Yes, you have. Well, I know I didn't have anything up. No, okay. that's it. Okay, I have one piece of additional business. So this year, um, Louisville Metro wanted to recognize our our partners. Um, we did something that we called the Move Louisville Awards, which is named after our transportation plan. Um, so uh, we want to, we recognized, um, I got recognized on here, Beth Neiman from KYTC District 5, uh, along with um, uh, some residents. So we want to recognize somebody from uh, KIPTA for helping uh, advance the community's transportation uh, network and transportation system. So I wanted to present this. Um, sign blade to Mr. David Burton for his contribution to the metro. David, something for you to hang on your wall. Yes. <laughs> or your telephone pole. Or, or your telephone pole in front of your house, yes. yes. Thank so you congratulations. Very much. Yeah. Thank in front of your parking spot. That's right. That's <laughs> <laughs> That'd be illegal sign. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Okay, with that, does anybody else have any other business for the good of the order? Okay, bad, uh, we're adjourned. Happy Valentine's Day.